Luke chapter 10. And as you're turning there, I want to talk to you today about entering into God's presence. Entering into God's presence. You know, there's nothing more precious than being able to enter into God's presence. Entering into God's presence. Luke chapter number 10. And before we read that passage of scripture, I want to lay a foundation of what we mean by the presence of God. You know, there are various aspects to God's presence. There are various aspects of God's presence, but I really want to highlight three primary aspects of God's presence. And this will lay a foundation so you'll understand uh, where we're headed and it'll, the message will be more clear. So three primary aspects of God's presence. Number one is what I call God's pervading presence. God's pervading presence. In other words, God is everywhere, all at once, all at the same time. God is everywhere. Uh, you may have heard the term, he is omnipresent. Omnipresent, omni means all and present. So we know that God is everywhere. Psalm 139 verse 7 says, where could I go to escape from you? Where could I get away from your presence? If I went up to heaven, you would be there. If I lay down in the world of the dead, you would be there. If I flew away beyond the east or lived in the farthest place in the west, you would be there. So what we know here is whether, that you, whether you are born again or not, and no matter where you live on this earth, did you know God is present? Amen. God is everywhere. Amen. So it doesn't matter if you left one city and moved to another city. God is there. And listen, this is true for believers and unbelievers alike. Whether you are born again or whether you are not, God is is everywhere. So in that regard, God is present. But did you know that just because God is everywhere doesn't mean that every person engages with God or has a personal relationship with him? Just consider being in a public place, like maybe you're at a grocery store, or maybe you're at a packed theater, or maybe you're in a packed airplane. And so you are in the presence of a lot of people, but you don't have a clue who these people are. You might not even have a clue who the person is sitting next to you in a, in a theater. You might be there for two and a half hours or so and not even engage, not even say hi. You don't know their story. You know nothing about them. And so similarly, God is everywhere, but that doesn't mean that people, in fact, most people do not engage with God's presence. They don't acknowledge him. They don't recognize him. And there's even a lot of people who deny his existence altogether. They don't believe he's there. But let me tell you, God is everywhere. Isn't that right? So just because God is everywhere does not mean we enter into his presence. We don't engage with his presence. You know, I often wonder... Uh, when I people watch, I like people watching sometimes, and you see total and complete strangers. And sometimes I, I wonder, I wonder what their story is, who they are, where they're from. And you know what's very interesting is most, of, actually, think about your friends. All of your friends at one point were complete strangers in your life. Isn't that right? You got to know them somehow. And how did you become friends and maybe a best friend, someone that you would even die for, right? I mean, you just, you, you, your heart is knit to this individual and there's, there's, there's friendships. And of course, marriage, of course, is another level of that. At one point, my wife was a complete stranger, did not know even she existed at all. But when, I, when you meet someone, you can engage with them. You can get to know their story. And I, also, I often wonder, I wonder how many of these perfect strangers, if I got to know, I'd really like them. And they might really like me. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe they won't. But nonetheless, the reality is just because people are present doesn't mean you engage with them here on earth. God is the same way. Just because he's everywhere doesn't mean we acknowledge him, we engage with him, we get to know him, and we build a personal relationship with him. So that is God's pervading presence. Number two is God's powerful presence. God's powerful presence. Um, some may call this his manifest presence. This is when God shows up in a profound way. And many times he demonstrates his power. For example, Paul and Silas, when they were in prison, they were in prison, but they entered into the presence of God and they tapped into the power of God. The, uh, when God came into that jail cell, his powerful presence showed up. Their shackles were loose, the prison doors were opened, and they were set free. Why? Not just because God was there but because they tapped into his powerful presence. Are you guys seeing this? The Bible says in Luke chapter number 5, uh, verse 17, about Jesus, when Jesus went into a, a physical home, 
The Bible says, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Notice the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So Jesus was not only physically present there, but the power of God was also present there to heal. But did everybody get healed in that home? No. How many people got healed? One. One person got healed. Why? Because that one person tapped into the powerful presence of God through faith. Tapped into the powerful presence of God. Though the power of God was present to heal, one tapped into it. You know how often God's power is present to heal, to save, to set free, to deliver? But many people don't know how to tap into God's powerful presence to see the power of God operate in their lives. Well, that's God's powerful presence. So just because God is everywhere doesn't mean we tap into and engage with his presence. And the third layer or aspect is God's personal presence. God's personal presence. Some may call it his abiding presence. But this is God's personal presence. You remember when Jesus left the earth, uh, or before he left the earth, he said to his disciples, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Yeah. He's not just saying, see, I'm everywhere. God's everywhere. No, he's saying, yes, I am everywhere. God is everywhere, yeah. but I'm with you. Amen. See, something a little bit more personal, another aspect, something a little bit deeper than just he's everywhere, he is with us. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, God himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hallelujah. So there's something more personal there, something more personal there. Uh, you know, when I think about going to an event, maybe there's a gathering at somebody's home, maybe it's for a birthday party or, or something, but there's a gathering, there's a party going on, and I'll go with my, my wife to that particular gathering. And I'll be there in the home, maybe there's, like I said, there's a party, there's a lot of people there, and let's say Pastor Carl and Terry there, are there at the party as well. So in that regard, they're present, and I'm present with them, and I'm with them in that regard, that we're, we're there. And... But that doesn't mean I'm going to say, I will say hi or engage with them. But if I say, hi, Terry, how are you doing? And I give Sister Terry a hug and Brother Carl a hug and I talk with them. See, now I'm engaging, not just present with them, I'm engaging with them. But listen to this. When I show up with my wife, there's another level of me and my wife. See, I'm with Carl and Terry in that place, but I came with my wife. She's with me, Right? I mean, no, there's different. And when I leave, my wife leaves with me. She's not leaving with you, Jack. <laughs> She's leaving with me. Why? Because there's a personal presence there. She's my wife. There's a personal presence there. And listen, using the analogy of my wife, we, um, we are married. So in that regard, it's like I've invited my wife into my home. Well, actually, she's invited me into her home. <laughs> okay, that's probably more accurate how it is. But, you know, we, um, you know we'll be, have fellowship. We'll, we'll come into, we'll, we'll, we live in the same home. We dwell in the same home. And I can come home from work. And I can be present in the same home with my wife. But that doesn't mean I engage with her. I could sit on the same couch with my wife. We could be watching the same thing. But I, that doesn't mean I interact with her. I could be in the same moment. I could be on my phone. I could be working. I'm going to school as well, finishing up my, or continuing my education um, in school at a university. And so I could be doing all the studies, all this stuff. And listen, I'm in relationship with my wife. She is in the house with me, but that doesn't mean I engage with her presence. Likewise, it's how it is so often with God. In fact, with that in mind, let's look at Luke chapter number 10. I asked you to turn there and look at verse 38. The Bible says, now it happened as they, the disciples and Jesus, went, that he entered, Jesus, entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him, Jesus, into her house. So I want you to notice something here, because we get on Martha's case, because we know what happens later. Most of us know what happens later. But I want you to, to notice here, she welcomed Jesus into her home. So Jesus is present in her home, okay? Then verse 39 says, she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So she has a sister named Mary. But Martha, but Martha, but Martha. Listen, Martha welcomed Jesus into her home, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. 
And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, Jesus said, one thing is needed. And Mary, as opposed to Martha, Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Well, what did Mary choose to do? Mary chose to sit at the feet of Jesus and engage with his presence. Now listen, we get on Martha's case, but she welcomed Jesus into her home. So he's present in her home, but she was distracted with much serving. How many of us as believers, we have invited Jesus into our lives? We've invited him into our lives. We are born again. We are set free. We have received the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we know he's in our lives. He's with us. Are you guys catching my drift? He's with us. But that does not mean that we engage with his, with his presence. Just like Martha welcomed Jesus into her home, but she was distracted with much serving. Are we too distracted and busy with life that even though we're Christians and even though God is with us, are we too distracted to spend time in his presence, to pause and enter into his presence? Sadly, I believe that that is the case often with us as believers. You know, one of the things I like to do in, in my spare time, sometimes just to decompress, I, I like to play the piano and I'm, you know, learning and practicing some things. And, and th- a couple weeks ago, my, my son came up to me and said, hey, Dad, can you stop playing the piano? <laughs> and let me just tell you, it wasn't because I wasn't playing well, <laughs> okay? He was really saying, Dad, I want to spend time with you. Can you stop playing the piano and spend time with me? And I realized... You know what? Here's a window of opportunity my son's giving me. I want to spend time with you, but you're just playing the piano. As silly as that is. I could be playing the piano and just, you know, there's nothing wrong, nothing sinful with that, but it can keep me from engaging with my son. See, the window, he's opening up a window. And I've heard from a lot of older parents with a lot of more wisdom than I do in raising kids tell me, appreciate those young years because it goes so fast. And I'm realizing these windows where he's only three, one is three, one is six, is so short. There's a window of opportunity right now. And I've also heard some parents say the time will come where the the roles will shift and you're trying to get their attention. But they're on their video games or electronics. Put that down and spend time with me. Well, you guys are catching what I'm saying here. We can be so distracted. Now, you know, it's funny. Yesterday, my son came up to me and said, hey, dad, I want you to play the piano all day. And I thought, that's highly suspect. <laughs> He's trying to distract me. He's up to something. So nonetheless, I was like, I'm keeping my eye on that boy that time. <laughs> Isn't it a shame to be in the presence of someone, but we just don't engage with them? We don't take those opportunities. How much more of a shame to be in the presence of God? We are born again. We've invited him into our life, and yet we're too busy to engage with his presence. So I'm talking about entering into God's presence. Let me give you some benefits on entering into God's presence. There are benefits to being in the presence of God. Listen to some of these promises and benefits. Times of refreshing come from the presence of God. Times of refreshing. Acts 3.19 says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. I don't know about you, but... I need times of refreshing. This world is draining. Isn't that true? There's so much pressure, so much discouragement, so much bad news, so much turmoil. And and there's so much responsibility, even outside of things that are, you know, tumultuous. I mean, even just responsibility of good things. Having kids, and my wife owns her own business, and I'm going to school, and I'm in full-time ministry, and we have kids, and we're homeschooling our kids as well. I mean, there's just responsibilities. The world has a way of just draining us. Responsibilities drain us. But listen, times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. When you're feeling weary, tap into the presence of God. Why? He'll bring refreshing to your soul. Fullness of joy comes from the presence of the Lord. Fullness of joy. Psalm 1611 says, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. I like that. Not just a little bit of joy. Fullness of joy. You know, there are so many people in our world that are dealing with depression and anxiety and dealing with, you know, uh, discouragement. 
And some are dealing with suicidal thoughts, and some have committed suicide and, and such, and just wonder, I just, they feel so drained, emotionally drained. You know what the Bible says? There's fullness of joy that comes from his presence. But listen, we have to stay in his presence longer than most of us do. It's like a dead cell phone battery. You can plug it in for five minutes and unplug and go, okay, well, I've got enough juice to do something, but it won't take long before it's drained again. And so sometimes we got to stay plugged into the presence of God and receive that fullness of joy. Isn't that good? The world has a way of sapping at our joy, but the Lord wants, us to, wants to give us fullness of joy. Listen to this. It's related, but gladness comes from the presence of the Lord. Gladness. Psalm 21, 6 says, For you have made him most blessed forever. You have made him exceedingly glad with your presence. Like fullness of joy. This is exceedingly glad. <laughs> and so the Lord wants this to overflow and for there to be gladness. Peace also comes from the presence of the Lord. Peace. Second Thess Thessalonians 3.16 says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. What's that mean? See, when the Lord is with us and we tap into his presence, he will give us his peace. Amen. You know, this world has a lot of tribulation, a lot of things that, that try to take away our peace. But it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. It doesn't matter what the bad news is. There's bad news everywhere you look, everywhere you turn. Everything you read is almost bad news. But you can find peace, not in the world, but peace in the presence of God. Supernaturally, if you're discouraged and you're feeling, man, worried, tap into the presence of God and experience his peace. Healing. Healing comes in the presence of God. Malachi 4.2 says, But to you who fear his name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. Healing in his wings. Lord will bring healing. Remember we read earlier that Jesus was in a home and the power of God was present to heal. Healing comes in the presence of the Lord. Listen to this one. Supernatural protection comes from the presence of God. Supernatural protection. Psalm 31.20 says, you shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of man. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of man. Again, no matter what's happening in the world with wars and rumors of wars and such, persecution, people problems, all the stuff, the economy, the Lord's saying, there is supernatural protection that you will have when you enter into my presence. In fact, Psalm 91 is a passage that's all about being protected by the Lord because you dwell in the secret place of the Most High when you're in His presence, there is supernatural protection. Listen to this one. Supernatural adjustments in our favor come in the presence of the Lord. Supernatural adjustments in our favor come from the presence of the Lord. Isaiah 45, 2 says, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. In other words, I will straighten things out on your behalf. I will straighten things out in your, in your favor to your benefit. God will straighten things out. You know what I love about this is God will straighten things out where we are, but I love that it says I'll go before you. He will straighten things out before we even get there. Because if we spend time in his presence, he's like, oh, you're engaging with me. And you, you know one way he can go before you is you pray about things before you, before you even start your day at work. You, you could be on your way driving in your car and you can engage with the Lord and say, Lord, I lift this day up to you. I pray that there be favor. I pray you bless the work of my hand. I pray there be favor of my boss. I pray that the clients or whoever, um, that their sales, that whatever it is. And as you pray, you invoke the presence of God into that situation. He can go before you and, make, and straighten everything out in your favor. Isn't God good? This all comes from the presence of God. And let me give you one more before, we, before I give you some practicals on how we can enter into God's presence. But blessings come from the presence of the Lord. Yeah. Blessings come from the presence of the Lord. In 2 Samuel 6, 11, the Bible says that the ark of the Lord, talking about the ark of the covenant, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. So notice the ark of the Lord was in this man's home for three months, and the Lord blessed him. Because the ark was there. Now, the ark is where the presence of God dwelled. Amen. So it, it, that's where his presence was. He inhabited the ark. Now, the good news is the New Testament tells us that God no longer dwells in the ark or a temple made with human hands, but he dwells with us. Amen. 
And again, now this is that abiding presence. So he's with us personally, but just because he's with us personally doesn't mean we engage with his presence. Okay, but listen to this. This is the point here. The ark of the Lord, or you can say it this way, the presence of God remained in Obed-Edom's house three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Why? Because the presence of the Lord was in his house. And because the presence of the Lord was in his house, he and his household were blessed. And word gets to King David in verse 12, and it says, Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him. In other words, the Lord was blessing his possessions. The Lord is blessing his food, the things that he has, blessing his house, sustaining things, I'm sure, but the blessing of the Lord. And notice they said it's because of the ark. In other words, because God's presence is there. Listen to how David responds. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David, where David lived, with gladness. In other words, David said, I want the presence of God where I live. And listen, don't you want the presence of God with you where you live? You can have the presence of God where you live. Many people go to church, and I'm glad they do, but many people go to church because it's a place where they encounter the presence of the Lord. But did you know you can have the presence of the Lord in your home? Yes. The presence of the Lord is not limited to, to, this, to this facility or you know, a gathering where you might be getting together, whether it's house church or not. I don't know about you. I want the presence of the Lord in my home. Like David, I want your presence in my home. Why? Because I want times of refreshing. I want fullness of joy. I want to be exceedingly glad. I need that supernatural protection. I need the Lord to straighten things out in my favor. Amen? Amen. And that all comes from the presence of the Lord. So you can have the presence of God in your home too. Well, how? How can we enter into the presence of the Lord and establish his presence in our lives and in our homes? James 4.8 says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God. I know this about my wife. I can be sitting on the couch with her. I've used this analogy before. I'm going to go back to be sitting on the couch or watching TV. But there's something about if I want to draw near to my wife and I just scooch over a little bit and scooch over a little bit more and I kind of touch her a little bit. My body's touching her and I put my arm around her. I can just read her body language. Something just melts in the atmosphere. I love that and she loves that too. And it can totally turn around our, our night for the positive. Praise God. All right? And so, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. <laughs> my soul. He wants to make sure. <laughs> draw near to God. You know why that happens when people draw near to us, that we, we draw near to them as well? It's because we're creating the image of God. It is so easy to draw near to God. He's already drawn near. He's already everywhere. Amen. He's already sent Jesus. He's given us salvation. He's given us his word. His presence is, is, is there. And for those of us that are born again, he is with us. Amen. It's so easy to enter into his presence. Just draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Hebrews 10.22 says, let us draw near with a true heart. Amen. In other words, it's not just lip service. Yes. It's not just doing religious activities. Like, well, I'm going to church, I'm reading the Bible, I'm just going to say a little casual, flippant prayer. No, it's when we draw near with a true heart. My wife knows when I'm drawn near with a true heart. <laughs> you know, and many, many women, uh, when they are, uh, you know, women with wisdom and prudence and discretion, they know when a guy is giving them lip service and when they really know, no, this, is a, this guy's, his heart's in that. I love giving my wife flowers, but there's something much different when I give her flowers connected to my heart. See, and that's the same thing with the Lord. It's not just doing religious activities. It's drawing near with the true heart. It's a heart that says, Lord, I want to be in your presence. I want to engage in your presence. So I'm drawing near with the true heart. So it takes intentionality, and it takes being very proactive. Let me give you four practical ways that you can enter into the presence of God. And by the way, you can do this anywhere and you can do this anytime. Here's the first one, is through prayer. You can enter into the presence of God through prayer. Psalm 145, 18 says, the Lord is near to all who call upon him. Amen. He is near, remember, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. He is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him in truth. See, there's that heart 
Position of the heart again, posture of the heart. It's calling out to him in truth. You know that entering into the presence of God is as simple as opening up our mouth and praying and welcoming God's presence. When you wake up in the morning, it's a perfect time for you to say, Lord, I thank you for this wonderful day. And Lord, I welcome you into my day. I pray that you go before me. You make the crooked places straight. You bless the work of my hand. Lord, go before me today. And, and as you pray, you will experience, engage with the presence of God. You will engage with the presence of God. Isn't it unfortunate that many times we feel so distant from the Lord when all we need to do is open up our mouth and invite him in That's right. and just talk to him. The Lord's a gentleman. He wants to be invited in, invited into our day. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. Listen to Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. In other words, the Lord's saying, I have a lot of things on my mind uh, for you, to give you a future and a hope. A lot of things. I have plans for you. And he says, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. See, people are looking for God, and even Christians looking for God. Lord, I need you, I need you. Where are you, where are you? Call out to God. Hallelujah. He's saying, if you search for me with all your heart, not just a 911 call like for a fire truck to show up, like, God, I just need you, but it's really, no, from the heart. You're saying, Lord, I want your presence with me. Open up your mouth and call out to God. And notice the Bible says, go and pray to me. Go and pray. There's difference between going and praying and praying on the go. That's right. Now, by the way, there's nothing wrong with praying on the go. I pray on the go all the time because I'm going places all the time. There's nothing wrong with praying on the go when you're in your car and you're on your way to work. Pray on the go. Nothing wrong with that. But there's something about going and praying. How many of you know there's a difference? Yes. Going and praying is like I'm setting aside time and I'm going to pray. That's why I'm going. I'm not praying on the go. I'm going to pray. And the Lord is saying, go, spend that extended time. So again, there's nothing wrong with praying and on the go. But sometimes we're not experiencing the presence of God because we're not carving out time to go and pray and to shut off the noise and say, Lord, I want to quiet um, the world. I want to turn off my phone. I want to just get away, get into your bedroom, close the door, get into the bathroom if you need to. That's the quietest place in my house with my kids and all that. So I'm just, <laughs> I need to go in the bathroom, you know, and close the door. But nonetheless, the point is go and pray. The Lord is near, and you will enter into his presence. And listen, everything comes with the presence of the Lord, the fullness of joy, exceeding gladness, supernatural protection, all the benefits of the presence of the Lord when we call out to him. Amen. Amen. So let's go and pray to the Lord. He will answer us, and he will be found by us. Here's number two, worship. Yes. Worship. We can enter into God's presence through worship. Notice the connection between entering into the presence of God and worship in Psalm 100. The Bible says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with what? Singing. 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 Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, be thankful to him and bless his name. So we enter into the presence of God with singing. Something about praise and worship yeah. engages us in the presence of God. It is so easy to engage in the presence of God through worship. And when I'm talking about worship, I am not talking about uh, the, the worship, I don't want to call it a performance, but the worship, I'll, I'll say it that way, but the worship performance on the stage, because did you know there could be a worship leaders, there could be a band, there could be musicians, and you could be watching people lead music, but you not enter into worship. So entering into worship is not being in a building where there's music to God being played. Entering into worship is when you engage with God in worship. There's something about lifting up your hands and singing out to the Lord. And you just, you, you enter into the presence of God. It is so simple. It is so easy. You can do this anywhere. You can do this in your room. You can do this in, in your car. You can do this in the bathroom. You can sing out to God. And, and his presence will show up and meet you there so easily, so easily. And you might not know a lot of songs. You might not be able to sing well. You might not be able to play an instrument. That's okay. 
Just sing a very simple chorus. Just get away and lift up your hands as a posture, a physical posture that matches the posture of the heart. Lifting up your hands and you can just sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Get what I'm saying? You can be in your bedroom. And even now I'm feeling the, the emotion because it's so easy to tap into the presence of God through worship. It just is. Sometimes we see the production in churches and think, well, that's just so big. Th that's not it. It's you engaging with God. Amen. Some of the most precious times that I have had in the presence of God through worship is when I'm just worshiping by myself, on my knees, Hallelujah. in my bedroom. And let me tell you, the next most precious time is when I'm worshiping with my family in my home. And when I see my boys, we'll just maybe put something on the TV of, of, a, of worship, a worship song, and, and I'll just lift up my hands and worship. And when I see them lift up their hands and worship, something, it's just the presence of God shows up. There are so many Christians that are living life outside of the uh, engaging in the personal presence of God, and it's as easy as opening up your mouth and praying and as easy as opening up your mouth and worshiping God. And his presence comes right in. Listen to Psalm 22.3. Uh, you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. You are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Notice, you are enthroned in the praises. You might have heard uh, people quote it this way. You inhabit the praises of your people. I heard one person say, it doesn't really say he inhabits praises of his people. It says he inhabits the praises of Israel. Okay, I understand that. But the New Testament tells us that if we are in Christ, then we are Abraham's seed and we are heirs according to the promise. So all of us Gentiles, we might not be um, of Israel or Jewish by natural biological uh, bloodline, but if we are in Christ, we are benefits of it. And so when the Bible says he's enthroned in the praises of Israel, there's something about our war praise and worship that God is enthroned in. Well, what does a throne mean? What does a throne represent? Well, a throne represents total power and total authority. When we praise and worship the Lord, we give God an invitation to come with all of his power and all of his authority in whatever situation we may be facing. Amen. Breakthroughs come in worship. Did you know that? Amen. There was a, a, a time, you can read it in the Bible, King Jehoshaphat, there was a huge army that was coming up against him, and he knew in the natural he could not defeat this this. This army, it was going to be, he was going to lose in the natural. He, he was outnumbered, um, outmaneuvered and such. But you know what he did? He knew he needed God. So you know what he did? The first thing he did was he prayed like we already read about. He prayed. And the presence of the Lord came. And the Lord spoke to him. And the Lord gave him wisdom. Why? Because he entered the presence of God. Yeah. Instead of walking in fear. And trying to attack things in the natural. And to figure out, well, maybe I'll try to work this in the flesh in the natural. And try to do what I can. No, he stepped back and said, I need the presence of God. I need to enter into his presence. So he prayed, and the Lord gave him wisdom. And you know what the wisdom of the Lord was? He said, Je Jehoshaphat, this battle is not yours. This battle is mine. Have you ever heard the saying, the battle belongs to the Lord? Because that's what the Lord said to Jehoshaphat. The battle belongs to me. But God said to Jehoshaphat, here's what I want you to do. I want you to send out the worshipers on the front lines. <laughs> not the Marines. The worshipers. And the Bible records that as the worshipers went out and they began to worship, the power of the Lord came into that situation oh and sent ambushes against the people and the enemy was destroyed before Israel. Hallelujah. Praise God. Why? Through worship. Because he's enthroned. And so they invited the power and authority of the Lord into that situation. Now, when we hear the term the battle belongs to the Lord, I want to touch on that because many Christians have turned it into a cliche saying, like, well, the battle's not mine, the battle's the Lord's. And so they, they take that to mean I can sit back and the battle's not mine, it's the Lord's. The Lord's going to take care of it, the Lord's going to take care of it. Listen, if you read it in its context, I already highlighted it, but when you read it in its context, God did say the battle is not yours, it is mine. The battle belongs to me. But God told Jehoshaphat, I still need you to engage with me and invoke my power into that situation. So it's not like, well, God, it's, it's, the battle belongs to the Lord. I don't have to do anything. No, it is the Lord's. But we invoke and engage with his powerful presence through prayer and through worship, and we activate the power of God. Are you guys catching this? It's a big difference. Let's not be passive Christians. Let's not be passive Christians. Let's be active and let's engage in the presence of God. 
So our praise and worship does two things. It gives us access into God's presence. And listen, it gives God's access into our situations. Let me say it gives us access into his presence, but it gives him access into our situations. Remember Paul and Silas when they were in prison? I quoted it earlier. How did they enter into the powerful presence of God? It was through worship. They were singing. And they were singing loudly, loudly enough to where the other prisoners were hearing them. It wasn't just a timid prayer. No, they're, they're praying. They're worshiping. And the power of God came through. Shackles were loose. The door was open. And they were, they were set free because they invoked the, the presence of God, as the power of God through worship. Here's the third is the word. The word. We can enter into the presence of God through the word. Jesus said something very interesting in John chapter 14. In verse 19, Jesus said, A little while longer... And the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Let me just stop for a second there. Pause. Because the Lord's saying, in a little while, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Now, let me tell you what he's talking about. He knows he's going to leave the earth physically. And when he leaves physically, the world is, are not, the world is not going to see Jesus physically anymore. They're not going to hear him audibly anymore. Because he's physically leaving the earth. But yet Jesus said... A little while longer, the world, they won't see me anymore. I'm gone physically, but you will see me. You will. See, he's talking now about a personal presence. I am everywhere. God is everywhere, but you will encounter me. You will see me. And so he, he goes on, verse 20, at that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So again, there's a personal presence. I'm in you. I'm, I'm with you. And verse 21 gives us a key. He who has my commandments or my words and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. I will manifest myself to him. I will show up for that person. And he's saying here, the the world's not going to see me anymore, but you will. How? How? The one who has my words and keeps it. Not just has a Bible on a shelf. But the one who has my word and keeps it. The one who is in the word. Keeps the word. Is a doer of the word. That is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him. And Jesus says. uh, And manifest myself to him. You know the Lord will manifest his presence. To you. Through the word of God. I can't tell you how many times I open up the Word of God, and this is one of the primary ways the Lord speaks to me personally. Now, the Lord speaks to others, you know, in, in, in different ways, but, but the, through the Word of God is the primary way the Lord just speaks to me. But let me tell you, it doesn't matter the primary way. Every time any of us open up the Word, we can enter into the presence of God. He will show up. God, I feel like you're so far away, and there's a Bible on our shelf. Or maybe we're even saying, I feel God's so far away, but we're telling other people instead of calling out to God in the first place. And saying, Lord, I invite you in. I invite you in. And so the Lord will manifest to us through prayer. Verse 22 goes on that Judas, not Iscariot, uh, Judas Iscariot betrayed him, so this is a different Judas, said to him, Lord, how is it you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? I like that Judas asked that question because even though Jesus already gave the answer, Jesus emphasized the same answer and then he gave a little bit more uh, clarity. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. It's back to the word of God. You have my word. This is how I'll manifest myself to you and not to the rest of the world. Through my word. And he says, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we, talking about he and God, the Holy Spirit, God, we will come to him and make our home with him. He's saying, I will show up. And not only that, I'll make my home there. See, God is everywhere, but he makes his home in certain places. And he'll make his home with the people who open up God's word and engage with him through his word. We can encounter God through the word. You know, one primary way we can bring the presence of God into our home is when our home, we open up our word in our home. If you're married and you have kids, open up the word with your, with your kids and your wife. And let me tell you, God will show up. Yes. His presence will be there. His presence will be there. Listen to a parallel passage in Revelation 3.20. The same writer of John who wrote John wrote Revelation 3.20. Uh, John wrote Revelation. Listen to what John 
said, well, it's actually Jesus is speaking here, and John's recording it. But Jesus is speaking, and he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. So notice again the parallel. Remember, in John's gospel, Jesus said, The one who has my word and keeps it, we will come to him and make our home with him. Here Jesus is saying, we will come into him and dine with him. See, that's talking about the same thing. You dine in your home. And when there's dining going on, there's, a, there's dwelling in the, in the same home, the same place. So it's a parallel passage here. Notice, though, what Jesus is emphasizing here. He's saying, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. I will come into him. You will engage in my presence. Now, most of the time when I've heard this passage uh, preached, I've heard it uh, said that this passage is talking primarily about salvation, that it means Jesus is standing at the door of our heart, and he's knocking. And if we open up our heart to Jesus, then he'll come into our heart, and we will be saved. Now, while I believe that this passage, it does apply to salvation, it's not limited to salvation. In fact, the context is much greater than salvation. The real context, what Jesus is really saying and what he's really after is ongoing fellowship. Amen. Not just, see, you need salvation to get the fellowship. So that's why I believe it applies. But just like Martha, many Christians invite Jesus into their heart, into their lives, but then from there they no longer engage in fellowship with him. And so Jesus is not talking to unbelievers here. He's talking to believers. He's talking to a church. And he's saying to believers, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. And if anyone hears my voice and opens up the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Well, let me just get to the bottom line. What Jesus is really saying is I'm standing at the door of my word and I am knocking. And if anyone hears my, not knock, if anyone hears my voice. Second uh, Timothy 3.16 says, that all scripture is God-breathed, came out of the mouth of God. It's God-breathed. This is where we get the term, it's God's word. Let me tell you, the word of God is the voice of God. Amen. A primary way we hear the voice of God is through the word of God. Yes. And so when we're reading the word, it's an opportunity for us to hear the voice of God. Let me just give you a real quick practical, and then we'll get to the fourth and, and final um, uh, example I'm going to give on entering into the presence of God. When you open up the Word of God, we can read the Word of God. Have you ever just read it and felt like, you're just so dry, you're not getting anything? Or am I the only one? I have days like that. You're just reading, you're like, I'm just not getting anything from this. Well, let me tell you, sometimes that's because my mind is too cluttered with other thoughts. It's hard for me to draw really near to here. I'm just, I'm going through it, but man, my mind is just going a million miles an hour. So you've got to just slow down and realize, I want to hear the voice of God. Because listen, you can read the Bible and not hear God's voice. Let me tell you what I mean by that. You can read it and not get a thing out of it. But have you ever read it and a verse jumped out to you? I suggest to you when a verse jumps out to you that you're hearing a knock. Now, many people blow past the knock because, well, i got to get my reading done. And you can blow past the knock. You could read your Bible, but you didn't hear the voice of God. So when a verse jumps out to you, you might not even know why it's jumping out to you. I suggest you stop. Pause. Lord, Sensing a knock. What are you trying to say to me? I want to hear. Well, what are you trying to say? See, if we will just understand that opening up the Bible is not just a religious exercise. It's not just a task that we can um, check off a list of religious obligation or duty. No, this is a way that God speaks to us Amen. when we enter into his presence so we can pause. There was a time where I was reading through the book of Acts and I was, came across the passage where the where Cornelius said to Peter, he just simply said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And I went and I uh, kept reading, but I felt like, why did that jump out to me? So I could have just kept reading. So well, I just need to get my reading done. Oh, check, got it, got it done. Did my daily devotions, did my daily reading. No, I went back. What are you saying? Lord, are you saying something? Now I could look at it and say, well, it's just a practical story. It's just a narrative. It's just a recording of a historical event. You know, it's just a descriptive story of what happened with Cornelius. But I felt, sensed that knock. And it's like as I leaned into the Lord, and I'm drawing near to hear his voice, I heard the Lord say to me, I want you to spend four days in prayer and fasting and spend time in my presence. Go and pray and fast. And I heard the Lord speak to me. And let me tell you, I responded to the Lord. I'm realizing I'm in the presence of God, and he's speaking to me. 
He wants to get my attention. But I could have blown past that knock. See, listen, I stand at the door, Jesus said, and I'm knocking. But if you hear my voice, open the door. In other words, respond to the Lord. Open up your heart. Didn't the Bible say, be doers of the word and not hearers only? Deceiving yourself. So be a doer of the word of God. And I'm telling you, I spent time in prayer and fasting. And I had an agenda thinking, well, here's what I'm going to pray and fast for. And the Lord scrapped the agenda from the very beginning. And he just said, just spend time in my presence for these four days. And he ministered to me for four days. I thought, well, I got a lot of things to do, God. I need you to talk about this. He said, just spend time with me. So you remember Mary and Martha? Martha welcomed Jesus into her home, but Martha was distracted with much serving. But Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and heard his word. Let's not just read the Bible like a textbook. Let's read the Bible to listen to the voice of God. In fact, listen to John 1. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In other words, the Word is God. Notice the Word was with God, the Word is God. Listen to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Listen, who's that? That's Jesus. The Word of God is not a what. It's not a mere textbook. It's a person. It's a he. It is Jesus. When you open up this book, you can treat it like a mere book. Or you can realize, no, I'm spending time with Jesus himself when I read this book. Oh, and times of refreshing will come. Exceedingly gladness will come. Fullness of joy will come. Supernatural adjustments in our favor will come. Why? Because you engage with the Lord through the word of God. Praise God. Praise God. Let me give you the fourth one. As we wrap this up, we can enter the presence of God through fellowship, through fellowship. And I'm referring to the fellowship with other believers. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 19, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth, talk about being on earth, that's us, human beings. If two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my father in heaven. Let me just pause there for a moment. The first Practical way that I mentioned that we enter into the presence of God is through prayer. But notice what Jesus is emphasizing here. If two of you agree on earth, there's something about another believer coming into fellowship with another believer and agreeing in prayer that does something uh, powerful in the spirit. Jesus says, if two of you agree, you don't need a, a million people on a prayer chain praying for you or agreeing with you. Just one other believer. Amen. One other believer. And it, 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 it provokes something in the spirit, something significant. And listen to verse 20. Because here's the principle. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there. Amen. I am there. I am there in the midst of them. So I'm talking about engaging in the presence of God. Did you know that every time you are gathered with another believer, God is there? gathered together in his name, not just socializing and all that, but, but did you know when you're gathering together with other believers, it's an opportunity to engage with the presence of God. But are we so busy or so distracted that when we get together with other believers, it's all about socializing? It's all about, you know, uh, participating in a, you know, watching the football game or uh, participating in a certain hobby, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I enjoy hobbies. I enjoy things, and, and I like doing things with other people. Isn't that right? I love hiking. There's a number of things I, I enjoy doing, and I enjoy doing with other people. But I can go hiking and doing these things with other believers and yet miss opportunities with these believers. I can encounter the presence of God. I love it when I'm talking to a, a friend who's a believer, and I might just be talking about something as natural as what's going on with my schooling. You know, as I've mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm continuing my education. I'm going to university um, uh, regarding theology, and I, I, I'm spending hours in studies and late nights, and um, sometimes I can get tired and, you know, and weary while I'm still working uh, full-time in the ministry. My wife has a business. We've got kids. We're homeschooling. I mean, there's a lot of, lot of busyness, a lot of distractions. And, and financially, you know, I'm, I'm paying for, the, for my, my school and such. And so there's a lot of things that can kind of weigh on me a little bit, right? And you just get tired. And sometimes I'm like, why am I doing this? You know, quite frankly. But sometimes I can talk to somebody and just say, yeah, I'm really tired right now. And boy, oh, I'm just kind of feeling it. And I'm just, I'm just mentioning something. But when a friend of mine will just say, yeah, well, let me just tell you, 
something like, may the Lord give you strength. May the Lord give you wisdom. May the, and I, you know that just that kind of talk from another believer, it's like, oh, man, thank you, Lord. We need other believers to nudge us sometimes. Isn't that true? No, just sometimes. I have, I grew up in a big family. My parents had six kids, okay? And I'm the second of the six kids and an older sister. And, and a lot of us have very strong personalities. In fact, all of us have strong personalities, all six of us, every single one. And, but some are much more actively aggressive and others are passively aggressive, but everybody's strong. You get what I'm saying? All right, so we're all strong personalities. And in a very loud home, six of us, a lot of competition. Sometimes you couldn't get a word in edgewise. But, and to get a word in edgewise, you had to get louder and louder and louder. Well, I'm just going to get louder and louder and louder. And then, but what you do is you shut down the ones that are a little bit more quieter. right? You kind of shut them out. Well, I, got, I built the ability to tune anything out. I can, tune, I can tune things out. I can tune things out without realizing I'm tuning things out. I could be sitting at the kitchen table having dinner with my family, and my mind can just go somewhere. And I'm thinking, and literally, I just saw well, all of a sudden Erica will like do something, my wife across, you know, across from me and get my attention, and I'll, and I'll come back <laughs> you know, to reality. And she'll say, are you not hearing Liam trying to get your attention? And listen, it's not that I'm ignoring him. I didn't hear him. <laughs> I consider it a blessing. <laughs> to be able to tune things out. My wife doesn't consider it a blessing. She tells me, you make me nervous when you're home alone with the kids. Are you, will you hear if they're burning the house down? I mean, I, 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 I just, I just uh, call it a gift. I don't know. But that's how I could probably study <laughs> and get things done. I don't know. But listen, we can do the same thing with God. Where it's, sometimes it's like God's not speaking. It's like, no, we're just literally just not even hearing him because we're so distracted. Yes. We are so distracted. And, and it sometimes takes another believer nudging us. Like my wife, Liam's talking to you. Sometimes another believer nudging and getting us back to spend time with God. Isn't there something special that can happen with other believers? Yes. What a great opportunity to spend time yeah. with God through other believers. When we're going to a birthday party, when we have birthday parties or something, we're going to a birthday party, and, and if it's uh, surrounded by a bunch of believers and it's a gathering of believers, you can just have a birthday party and fellowship and socialize. Yeah. Isn't it powerful when you get together and somebody just takes the lead and says, hey, why don't we come around the, the birthday person, let's stretch our hands toward them, and let's begin to just pray blessing over them. Listen, the presence of God can come in, oh, yeah. and not only will that person be blessed, but sometimes others get blessed in the process. Prophetic words can come out. The word can begin to come out, and the presence of God comes in there. Or a bunch of believers, we can have a birthday party and all go home, but yet miss an opportunity yeah. for us to in engage in the presence of the Lord. And let me close with this final thought. Something powerful happens when we enter into God's presence using a combination of all of what I mentioned. When we gather with other believers, but we gather with other believers to pray, to worship, to open up the word, and to fellowship. And I don't mean socialize, I mean fellowship around the word, fellowship around the, the Lord. And it doesn't require going to a church campus. You can do it in your own home. And did you know, by the way, church is not a building. Church is not a building. We, we in the Western model call buildings, churches, because it's a gathering of believers, but biblically a church is any time that two or more believers are gathered together in the name of Jesus. You can have church in your own home. Even if it's just your spouse, your kids, and they're born again, you can have church right there in your home. And you can, you can pray as a family, you can worship as a family, you can open up the word as a family, you can fellowship around the word as a family, and the presence of God can came in, come in. Remember David said, I want the presence of God in my home. I want us to have the presence of God in our homes. Something powerful happens when we have a combination. Listen, pray on your own, worship on your own, read the word on your own. But there's something about this fellowship. But when you're fellowshipping with other believers, bring it all the way back. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in worship. Spend time in the word. And I'm telling you, you will enter into the presence of God. And, and many of the problems... And the answers that we need in our, uh, the problems that we're facing and the answers that we need will be answered in the presence of God. Remember that list of benefits? Yes. Fullness of joy, times of refreshing, um, supernatural protection, supernatural adjustments, healing and such, blessing of God, peace, all of that comes if we will simply engage in the presence of the Lord. Why don't we stand up to our feet? Let's respond to the Lord. 
I don't know what it is the Lord was saying to you through this message. But why don't we just right now, let's, let's enter into the presence of God. And listen, as the word has come forth, the message, I hope you were hearing the voice of God, not just hearing the sermon, not just hearing the talk, but you were hearing the knock that God was speaking to you. He was customizing this message. And whatever it is the Lord's saying, I want you to engage with him. But let's, let's if, if, if you're comfortable with it, lifting up your hands and let's open up our mouth and let's invite the Lord into our lives. Like, like Martha, you've already, you're, you may already be born again. But if you're not born again, just call out to the Lord and say, Lord, I surrender my life to you. I give my life to you. I call Jesus my Lord. Invite him in for the first time. And for those of us, we are born again. The Lord is in our homes, so to speak. He's dwelling with us, so to speak. His presence is with us. But let's engage with his presence and tell the Lord, Lord, I don't want to have missed opportunities. I don't want you dwelling in my home but yet I don't acknowledge you. I don't spend time with you. You're with me, yes, but Lord, I want to engage with you. Let's open up our mouths. Let's engage with the Lord. Let's invite him. Lord, we invite you into our lives. Lord, we invite you into our home. Lord, we welcome you like Martha into our lives and into our home, but Lord, help us to engage with you. Help us to lay aside our busyness. Help us to lay aside the distractions and to keep ourselves focused on you, Lord. May we not be too busy that we cut out time with you, Lord. Lord, so we invite you. Lord, I pray for fullness of joy over, over us as we engage in your presence. Lord, I pray for exceeding gladness to overtake your people in your presence. Lord, I pray for supernatural protection. I thank you, Lord, that you bring... Uh, uh, you make supernatural adjustments in our favor, that you make the crooked places straight. You straighten things out for your people. Lord, may times of refreshing come from your presence, Lord. Even now, may there be refreshing that flows because we're engaging with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just tell the Lord, Lord, I want to engage with you. And just with your own heart, draw near to God and let him know, Lord, I'm drawn near to you. Lord, help us. Help us to engage with you. Show us the distractions. Show us the opportunities that we can, we can take to spend time in your presence, God. And I thank you, Lord, as we do, that all those benefits that come with your presence come. But it's not about the benefits. It's about you. Lord, we love you. We approach you with a true heart. A true heart. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Were you blessed by the word this morning? Yeah. God is good. Yeah.